opening up the mailbag, getting into questions about Jalen Brown, some of the other players, and the coaching staff. What's the best option there? It's all right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Be ever ready. Recognize the city of champs. Boston, baby, we do what you can. Locked on number 18, Tatum and Brown, J team. Step back, we gon' wet that and slay teams. Of course, the Celtics, who else could it be? Screaming like KG with the Larry OB. Corral is above average, assessing the team status. Best daily pod, no cap, salary matching. Clutch like Bird to DJ, keep John on replay. Prime time, dapping up the truth on the sideline. Rain and Jays, how it started, raising banners, how we finish. Locked on Celtics pod, home of the winners. B. Hey there, welcome back to the Lockdown Celtics podcast right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network where it's your team every day and I'm here for you every day with a free, fresh podcast dropped directly to your device if you're a subscriber. So go ahead and open up your favorite podcasting app, subscribe to the show, get it dropped directly to your device whenever I drop a new episode. Do the same on YouTube, ring the bell. When a video hits, you'll get notified. Hop into the comment section. Let me know what you think. I'm John Corrales. I used to play. Now I cover the team for Boston Sports Journal. And today I'm opening up the mailbag. A little bit of a, an adjustment because tomorrow I'll be talking about what Brad Stevens said. Uh, I have also, and this was going to be the Thursday, Friday podcast, uh, a long conversation with Keith Smith about the new collective bargaining agreement. Uh, how that impacts the Celtics. It's it's a good, long, in-depth conversation. That's going to air Monday, Tuesday. Two parts, Monday, Tuesday. It's it's a lot. And let me tell you something. I hate the new collective bargaining agreement. I think it's trash. I think the Celtics are getting screwed. All that is going to be saved for Monday, Tuesday. Tomorrow, again, Brad Stevens, he's talking on Thursday to the media. So I'll have full coverage on Boston Sports Journal full podcast on what he said, reacting to what he said. So today I thought, Hey, well, this is a great opportunity here. I have an open spot. Let's get into the mailbag. People have been sending in comments and questions over the past few days, like crazy. And I figured let's just answer a few of those here while I have the chance. Today's show is brought to you by prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com, Download the app. First time users can get a 100% instant deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. With the promo code locked on, that's prizepicks.com. Promo code locked on. Uh, questions come in via johncorrales.com slash mailbag, johncorrales.com slash mailbag. If you want to send in questions, uh, I didn't put the call out, but people just know that that's where you send in the questions now. And I've been flooded with, with a ton. So I'm sorry that I haven't been able to get to all of them. Hopefully, as I do podcasts, you get some uh some of these answered organically but here are a few questions uh starting in the, the first segment let's just focus on Jalen Brown it starts with Nathan it feels like the Cs are almost in a Kemba Walker type situation Charlotte wouldn't give him the full max for five years so the Celtics gave him a full four and regretted it would it be insulting to offer Jalen five years 233 which is the normal full max that's nearly 47 million a year uh, that's a lot of security, and could it and couldn't it be pitched that they can keep more of the core together? More importantly, it's a, is a dude who dribbles like that and zones out in terrible spots on defense worth fifty eight million per year. Okay, lot a lot there with this one question. Let's let's kind of work our way backwards a little bit. Uh the what he's worth when you, when you look at the numbers, the fifty eight million per year, the big monster numbers, you can't. You just can't think of it that way. You just can't think of, well, Jalen Brown is going to get this much money. Historically, that's more money than anybody. Why should Jalen Brown, considering these flaws, and he has flaws, why should Jalen Brown be the highest paid player in NBA history? Well, um, because that's just where they are. That's just, that's just, first of all, congratulations for being the lucky guy that is is likely going to be the richest player in NBA history for like 10 minutes, right? We can't get too caught up in, he makes $58 million because that's just what elite players make. And 
and the the system pays these guys. It pays a Jalen Brown the same it's gonna pay the the top top level guys, right? There's no super super max for Giannis and uh, the, the the top five player Kevin Durant, Nikola Jokic. There's no separate tier for them. When you get to be a certain level of player, you're gonna get the max, and they do have the super max for all NBA players. So that's first, second, or third team. There's no second team max, right? There's in that that would be a like thirty two and a half percent of the cap, and third team all NBA max would be like thirty point eight percent. So and then down to you didn't make it, so here's thirty percent of the cap. They don't have a tiered system like that. You make an all NBA team, you get the super max, you get it. If a team wants to keep you, that's what they got to do. So it is what it is. Get used to it in five years. By the time he's in year three of this deal, four year of this deal, his contract will look kind of more normal, right? Because all the other guys like Jason Tatum and guys like the, the, the really big, the MVPs, are going to be making sixty million a year, seventy million a year, and and Jalen will be uh, a bit below them. This is just what it is. Can the Celtics would would it be insulting to offer him two hundred thirty three million dollars over five years? Uh, I don't think that's insulting necessarily, but I don't think Jalen Brown might see it that way because Brown has been you know the first time around when he got his big deal. And it's a lot of money. He was asked to take less because, you know, he had some shortcomings and they were going to pay J- Jason Tatum his full max. And they, they wanted to make sure they kept everybody together. I don't know that you can come around to Jalen Brown again and say, hey, um, we were going to pay you the whole thing, but now you had those eight turnovers and we don't want to. Uh, they could potentially go to him and say, Hey man, this was the plan, but the new collective bargaining agreement really, really screwed us. And it's kind of your fault because you're in the union. And so the punishment is that we can't give you 35%. We can give you five years and 33% or five years and 32%. And it's more than any other team can pay you, but it's not going to be the full supermax because we are we are kind of stuck if we if we give that to you. Can they do that? How is he going to react? I don't know. He sounds like a guy, he had been sounding like a guy that may not take too kindly to that kind of thing. So can the Celtics give him a Kemba Walker type offer, a Charlotte to Kemba type offer? Sure. I don't know that he's going to take it. And I don't think that that's going to sit well, even if they say, okay, we'll give you five years and 32% and he he'll lose his mind. And they go, okay, fine, here's 35%. And he might just say, you know what? No, actually, no, I don't want it anymore because you guys don't value me. That I can see that happening, and that will force a completely different tact. Um, so I don't think that that's how the Celtics can do it. They can talk to the agent, and they can they can ask, they can say, hey, look, Let's let's just have a discussion. We're not making an offer. We're not lowballing. But here's the situation. How understanding is Jalen of this situation? Uh, and obviously, an agent is not going to be like, well, yeah, yeah, he'll take less. But they can broach it. They can they can bring it up. They can say, hey, we're we're kind of stuck, and it would be a great help. It would be a great help. If we can do 32% of the max and, and maybe the answer would be like, well, if you give Jason Tatum 32% of the max and both, both stars sacrifice, then yeah, we can talk. But if you give Jalen 32% and Jason comes along and there's no question about the 35%, then you've got an issue. Then you got, mm, we'll, we'll, that might not go over well. Let's flow right into Ryan's question who says, you guys have said for years you can't break up the Jays, but it seems like they bring out the worst in each other overall. No matter who else joins the team, they keep making the same mistakes. Am I wrong? Um, This is an interesting 
conversation because the last few years they have made the same mistakes. And is it because they're playing together? Uh, or is it because these are just the mistakes that they're prone to and they've they've needed to go through their, their worst to reach their best? And you're saying, hey, well, John, they lost in the finals and they didn't take that lesson and apply it. Now they lost in the conference finals again. They're back to losing in the conference finals. I, I still don't think you you have to blow this up and and break up the Jays. Uh, would I entertain the possibility of Jalen being traded if it meant bringing in a guy who could make a similar impact at a different position that made a little bit more sense? Okay, we can talk about that. If you're getting Jalen level production out of a power forward or a center and you're working your way or a point guard, then if you're doing that over a similar course of time, like not just next year and the year after, we can talk about that. We can. But I think you still have to keep these guys together. And there has to be a come to Jesus where maybe part of this negotiation with Jalen is, hey, you continue to do the same stuff. How We'll give you 35%. But what are you giving us? Are you giving us the same guy who turns the ball over in game seven of a conference finals? Or are you going to understand that forcing the issue is, is going to be bad no matter what? Are you going to play within the offense and understand you are a super max player, but also you do have to have uh, some like there are limitations to what you can you can you give us that? If you can give us that, if you can accept who you are and play within yourself, then we'll give you the money. Uh, but we're not going to do it. If you, if you come in here and say, you, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be the same guy because that's the second team all NBA guy, then that that's not going to work. So there are conversations that need to be had. I still think keeping them together is the current best option and – Going back to Nathan's question, I don't think you can mess around with the Jalen Brown contract. You can try, you can broach it, but I'm I'm not messing around with this. I think there are other ways you can go. Which brings us to the other player questions, the others. What can the Celtics do with Al Horford and some of the other role players? Uh, I'll talk about that next. First, today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA Finals because right now, you new customers, and there's a lot of you in Massachusetts as as it was recently legalized, you all get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. It's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. You can check it out. There are great promotions there every single day on FanDuel on the app. That app is safe and secure, and you get paid instantly when you win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action, the finals action, than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and go to No Sweat First Bet up first bet up to two thousand five hundred dollars. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. We just ask you if you're going to bet, please gamble responsibly. Once again, thank you for making Locked On Celtics your first listen every day. Again tomorrow, Brad Stevens addresses the media. I'm sure he's going to say a lot. I will break down the biggest stuff here on the podcast tomorrow. Back to the mailbag question. Uh, Meriden says, uh, since I'm 99% sure the Celtics will offer JB the super match and Max and Joe will stay um, and get some help off, help off the bench. Can we have a discussion about the role players? And by that, I'm including smart Rob Brogdon, Grant, Al Hauser, who stays and who goes um so that is uh interesting question because it's part of the conversation that i had with keith that's going to be next week monday and tuesday uh my my guess is brogdon goes and this is kind of like a tease 
for what, what Monday and Tuesday are going to bring. Trade Brogdon. See what you can get back. See if you get your Grant Williams replacement. You let Grant Williams walk. You elevate uh, Peyton Pritchard to the third guard. You now have Brogdon out. Grant gone. Theoretical trading for Grant Williams replacement somewhere in there uh, to save money. And Hauser sticks around. Al obviously sticks around. Peyton Pritchard sticks around and plays the third guard role. Smart and Rob, I think I think the choice is going to be between the three guards. So they might say Marcus Smart's amongst the, the potential uh, outgoing players. I can see that possibly happening, but I don't think that he's going to be the guy. I think it'll be Brogdon. Rob, I think he just needs a healthy offseason, and he'll be back. Now, I don't know what Joe Mazzula is going to say or do or with, with Rob. That's going to be part of the – when I talked about in yesterday's podcast, everybody has to get on the same page. This team has to get on the same page. Who the hell are you? What kind of team are you going to be? What is your identity? Know it from the start, execute it perfectly, and you'll be fine. But where does Rob fit? Is he an off-the-bench guy or is he a starter? Is, is he a situational starter or is he never a starter? Figure that out going into the season. Obviously, things change, but get that identity set going into the season and you can adjust from there. But my best guess is Brogdon is probably gone. Grant is a real question mark. He may be gone. It just depends on what the return is for Brogdon, what the approach is. And then I expect Al to play a role, potentially off the bench, smart to be his normal self. Rob, hopefully after a a summer of getting healthy is fine. And yeah, that's the plan. Um, now, Paul said, uh, this is water under the bridge, but why does Al get a pass three feet from the basket and spin and toss out to someone for three-point shots without ever taking a look at the basket? This is from Game 7. He did that six or seven times during Game 7, and all of the shots were missed. Uh, the team would have a better would be better off if he took the shot in the paint. Now I agree that I, when you get Al the, the the ball in that spot, I would have loved to have seen him uh, turn and shoot and, and use some of his strength. But a couple of things there. First of all, he, I don't know how much he had left. Second of all, by, by catching there, the Celtics, I think were trying to get going from three and I think that's just a uh, a team philosophy thing under Missoula. That shot, that that get it to Al, draw the attention, kick it to guys in the corner, that is actually a higher percentage shot because they are th- that's a shorter shot. It's worth three versus two, and it's uncontested or lightly contested versus Al, who can still make shots contested, but the percentages of him making the shots uh, contested from that spot are are lower than the open three-point shots. In retrospect, obviously, in hindsight, there's uh, they missed all the shots. So you think, well, <laughs> they missed all of those, so they should have just taken the Al Horford. But if Al knew going into it, Hey, I'm going to make this play, and you're always going to miss the shots. Well, then Rob, then Al probably wouldn't have made all of those passes. You know, you don't you don't make all those same passes if you know that guy's going to shoot and miss. You can make the pass and hope that the, that guy just moves the ball. But regardless, I get why he did it. So, yes, I understand why you say it. I understand why Al is is a good option on the post, but at this point. Um, the, I think philosophically, that's what the team wants. They want the open three pointers and statistically that's, that's a better shot in that situation. So I get, it doesn't jive with a lot of the, the other stuff, but, uh, the stuff that you normally think of, but here we are, uh, 
Paul, again, this is the same Paul. Uh, it seems obvious that this core of the team is not capable of winning a championship. Tatum Brown and Smart, even Robert Williams, have been together four or five years and have not gotten it done. I think they're just not good enough. Do you feel that changes have to be made? Don't you think the coach has to be changed? It seems that this team can't wait to get out of town and away from each other. I don't see how this can continue. Um, I I disagree with a lot of this, but I will say this. Something about those exit interviews after the game didn't sit well with me. It just, it felt kind of, um, kind of like if you've ever been in a breakup where the other side takes it a little more mutually than you thought, um, uh, and it doesn't matter which side of you are. If you if you know what I'm talking about, like you go through a breakup, and the other and the other side isn't like devastated by it. The other side's like, oh, oh, that sucks. But you know, you know, hey, I wish you the best. And like, where's the tears? Where's the where's the? I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> Where? What can I do to get better? Well, what can we do to save this? There's none of that. There was like, hey, I'm breaking up with you. And the other side was like, oh. I didn't see that coming. Well, well, you know, hey, good luck. And you're like, whoa, okay. You're, it's, it's almost like you're taken aback. Like, wait, should should I be the one fighting for this? Or, wait a minute. You're supposed to be devastated. There was some element of that too, especially like Marcus Smart. Like Marcus Smart's up there talking about, we're going to go watch some film. And I'm like, watch what film? Season's over. What film are you going to watch? So this notion that the, the team seemed kind of like anxious to leave. I can't shake the feeling that there was some level of something behind these, these interviews that I think either the adversity that they faced behind the scenes was much more than we realized and like the 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 team the guys who up there talking were like yeah you have no clue how bad it was in that locker room uh we're lucky that we got this far and and maybe maybe i don't know maybe some of the stuff that that was reported that we, we just kind of like crapped all over after the the Celtics got back to 3-3 maybe there was some of that maybe maybe guys were not as together they, they seemed together. They talked about how together they were, but I don't know. I don't know what was going on in that locker room, but I can tell you one thing that I am. I'm, I may not be right about a lot of stuff. I might not be right about basketball all the time, but I've spent a lot of time observing people. I have spent a lot of time understanding people's reactions. And when, when something is out of whack, it sticks out to me. That's how you're supposed to be like when you're trained as a journalist. And, uh, you know, this is one of the things you're, you're supposed to be. It's the power of, of observation. And I pride myself in having a very keen eye when it comes to like, wait a minute, that behavior is off. Why is that behavior off? And maybe we never find out. But I can tell you what. That post series behavior, aside, like Jalen's made sense. Jason's, I think, made sense. Al was, considering how devastated he was last year and how he's only got a year or two left, he was just very much like, hey, you, we went through a lot there. Marcus was especially, like, Marcus is all about winning plays. All about, like, the, the, I don't know, do whatever it takes to win. After that game was over, he was, it, it was like he was talking about a loss in February. I could not figure it out. I don't know what's going on there. So I don't know where that leaves this core. They are capable. They are capable of winning a championship. They got to the finals last year. They got to game seven of the Eastern Conference finals. That 
just by virtue of those things, they are capable of winning a championship. Um, I think they, they are good enough. Now, do they have the right mentality? Do they have the right mindset? Are they in the right headspace? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, this is a critical summer. Joe Mazzulla is sticking around, and this summer is going to be huge in determining whether these guys can win a championship together. So do changes need to be made? I think, I don't think anything monumental. I think the coach is sticking around and I'm fine with the coach sticking around. We'll talk about the coach next. First, I want to thank you for making Lockdown Celtics your first listen every day. Once again, Monday will be the first part of a two-part conversation with Keith Smith on the collective bargaining agreement, which I hate, 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 hate it. So that's going to be fun. Uh, that's Monday. As usual, also check out the rest of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's the NBA Finals. If you want to keep up with any of that, Lockdown Nuggets, Lockdown Heat, Lockdown NBA, uh, full coverage there. Let's get into questions about the coaching. August says there's a lot to criticize about Missoula, but this is the third coach whose team has really struggled against Miami zone through a series, reverting back to bad threes uh, and failing to penetrate year to year. We know it's coming and I'm even, uh, whatever, uh, Miami and Celtics cores are, aren't vastly different is the problem. The players and they'll just never get it. Well, <sighs> I mean, one is, it's one of the things that I wrote about at the beginning. That they do know what's coming. They do know what's happening. I don't know why they get so flummoxed by the zone. Um, is it the players? Yeah, it's the players. Uh, but also the coach has to be aware. Coaches on the sideline have to be aware. It's it the 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 zone, you have to be ready for the zone. You have to anticipate the zone is coming. You know, if if you see it. And it's it's too, um, it's it's too disruptive. Call the timeout and be like, "Hey, they're in a zone. Remember, this is the zone offense." Or call the play from the sideline. Have specific zone plays. Uh, I, I I don't know. I don't know why. I, I just think it goes back to uh, Jalen Brown saying, "You know, we get apprehensive at the end of games, and they don't want to be the ones who screw up, and they end up being the the ones who screw up." Uh, Missoula is responsible for that as well. He needs to make sure that they are aware that he needs to see it. The coaching needs to see it. They need to be calling it out. Uh, I can see it from where I sit. Everybody who's writing about the, the game can see it from where they sit. People in the stands, people at home, the coaching, the, the, the coaching staff needs to on the sidelines be like, Hey, zone zone. Hold up a card. Hold up like a red card from the uh, the side of the bench. So when people look over, they can see, oh, it's a zone. It's red. It's a zone. Okay, here's what I got to do. Whatever you got to do, get the tricks because somebody's got to have a trick up their sleeve to, to demonstrate that zone is coming. Be aware of it. These are the things that you do against the zone. But it's on the players. It drives me nuts. It's on the players. Um uh, and and will they this concept of that they'll just never get it? I, I just don't understand how how NBA players can never get a zone. It's a freaking zone. We all know how to bust the zone. Lewis, my realistic rebuilt coaching staff around Joe, assuming guys like Budenholzer, Doc Rivers, Vogel wouldn't want to do it, would be Steven Silas in the in the Will Hardy role, Sam Cassell in the Damon Stoudemire role. Chad Forcier in the Ben Sullivan role and David Vanderpool running the defense. What do you think about something like this? Well, it's an interesting thing here because uh, Aaron Miles, Ben Sullivan, and uh, somebody else, one of the other assistants, uh, it will be going to join Ime Udoka in Houston. So the Celtics have, I think, five assistant coaching positions now uh, that they're going to have to fill, which should be. Uh, a lot of fun. This is a great, great opportunity for the Celtics. 
this this plan i i like this plan uh steven silas as a former head coach uh having seen things and gone through things but a young guy uh good pedigree uh he in you know a connection to the celtics through his dad would be an interesting guy and he's been hanging around the team so you know that that's an interesting conversation there to, to about bringing him in sam cassell who was on doc rivers staff in philly i don't know if he's going to bounce around with doc rivers what he's what his plan is but him in the damon stoudemire role former look people know sam cassell people know he has a penchant for being clutch in games uh and and he was never shy about it i would love to have a veteran like sam cassell in here Guys like uh, Forcier and Vanderpool, it's this, this is a person, clearly, Lewis follows the league very closely. If you know these assistants from other teams, um, Forcier was, uh, or Forcier was uh, with Milwaukee. Now, obviously, uh, Budenholzer's reign there is over. I don't know if he's he's hooking back on there with somebody else. I don't know what his situation is, but he's been around. He's been around um, for a while and has seen a few things. He could be he could be a, a very valuable type of guy. Vanterpool has bounced around the league for a long time. Uh, was with Brooklyn, so another coaching staff that was in flux. Uh, I don't know what his status is, but he's he's been around, coached some. Uh, he's a former player, barely at the NBA level who has worked in uh, Portland, who worked with Damian Lillard and and has, has worked with stars, worked with stars for sure. Uh, the thing about this group, they are, they are all wannabe head coaches, right? These are, and, and let me just say for the record, I, I don't want a Frank Vogel type and I don't think they're going to bring in Vogel. And I don't think Vogel wants to be part of this in an assistant coaching role either it's it's i don't think it's something he's looking for i don't think it's something well the celtics would be very happy to have uh frank vogel on the staff he's a, he's friends with brad stevens and that level of experience would be very welcome on the staff boston would love to have him i'm not so sure that he's interested in that uh and i don't think that joe Mazzulla would be interested in, in bringing a guy like that in because if the Celtics go on a, a four-game losing streak in December, there's instantly going to be higher Frank Vogel calls. Like it, it's not going to be fair to to Joe Mazzulla. This is about putting a staff together that will do things the right way. And hey, Stephen Silas, Sam Cassell, more obvious names, guys who have interviewed, guys who have been. Uh, Silas has been a head coach, obviously. Sam Cassell has interviewed for for jobs. You you don't want to have Joe Missoula coach looking over his shoulder, but um, you definitely want to get him some help. Guys like Forcier and Vanterpool have been looking for head coaching jobs themselves. So how committed are they to this type of role? I, I could go either way, right? They, they could be frustrated by having to be assistants again. I, I don't think there are any jobs that are kind of opening up out there. So they, they have to buy their time. They could sit there and say, hey, Boston is on the verge. If we go to Boston and the story becomes that solidified coaching staff was what Boston needed to get over the hump, if that's the story, if that's the podcast I'm doing on June 1st, 2024, how the Celtics got to the NBA Finals because their coaching staff was uh, a, a staff that they could, the players could lean on and rely on, and Joe Missoula has relied on, and they all benefited. Then these guys are going to get poached, and that's exactly what these guys want. They want to be in a situation where they can get poached. So if that's where it goes, then I'm, I'm all for it. My, my general plan for Joe Missoula's staff, like I said, five openings there, you want some obviously some some guys that Joe is comfortable with some some kind of more brilliant young minds. You want to get a couple of guys with some some heavy duty experience who have seen things and can relay those things to Joe. And you want to get the former players 
you definitely want to get some former NBA guy, a Sam Cassell. Absolutely. You want to get guys on that staff that the players can relate to. And if those guys all legitimately have Joe Missoula's ear, then that's something that uh, could work really, really well. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, all of these guys, like I said, are going to want head coaching jobs. And if they can help get the Celtics to that next level, winning a championship, they will become head coaches. We will see at least a couple of those guys become head coaches. And hey, that's that's all you want. Then you can, I don't care, then to hire a new staff the, the year after that. Uh, I, I you know, feel tempted to be like, oh, no, I want to get guys that can stick around here. You know, you want to get like three or four years of, of these guys. Uh, okay, but at the same time, whatever wins a championship, whatever gets these guys to the next level, and then worry about the next the coaching the next coaching staff the next year. So I, I'm all for that plan. Finally, with Kyle, we'll wrap with this. He says, "Not a question, just the corny line I thought of that might cheer you up." And he says, "Quote: The 76ers are like a sick patient. First they try to doc, now they're bringing in a nurse." Hold for applause, and there we go. All right, Kyle. Hey. Maybe that put a smile on your face, maybe a groan, but whatever it was, I appreciated it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, checking out the show. If you're a first time listener, I appreciate you very, very much. If you're a long time listener and every dayer, that's, that's awesome. Thank you so, so much for making this show part of your daily routine. I see a lot of you commenting saying, you know, saying thank you for the show. I, I'm just going to throw that right back at you and say, thank you for listening I do the show for you. I do the show for Celtics fans. I do the show for the hate listens from the other side. Try my best to give you an entertaining and informative show that you can that that helps you become a smarter, better fan. And uh, hopefully, that's that's something that uh, you can attest to. Uh, and that that's what makes me happy. Do I make your Celtics experience better? That's all I want because basketball is awesome. And being a Celtics fan is great. And if I can make that even better for you, then I'm the happiest person in the world. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And thank you for sharing the podcast. Tell your friends, tell everybody that they should be listening to and watching the Lockdown Celtics podcast right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.